Galatians chapter 6, coming to the end, and uh, we'll pick up in verse 1. Actually, we'll back up and, and we'll take a look at verse 26 of chapter 5 as well. It would appear that this verse in verse 26, and, well, verse 26 actually, chapter 5, is, is connected to the um, first six verses of chapter 6 of Galatians. Remember that the... Um, Chapters and verses in the Bible aren't inspired. Uh, they were just put there to basically for us to, enter, uh, to be able to find things faster. Can you imagine if we said, uh, if we had no chapters, no uh, verses, uh, what we'd have to do? We'd have to read the whole thing, right? To find what we wanted to find. And, and uh, wouldn't that be an awful thing to read the whole Bible? No. Actually, I think maybe that would be a good idea. But it's there for our, uh, so we can identify things quicker. Uh, Lucy came to Charlie Brown one day and asked him a question. She asked, uh, why are we here on earth? And he replied, to make others happy. And Lucy pondered this answer for a moment, and then she asked, then, why are all the others here? <laughs> if you haven't discovered, if you haven't discovered it yet, Christianity isn't about us as much as it is about others. In Galatians chapter 5, we saw a key phrase begin to appear. We saw that key phrase in, the, in two words, one another. Matter of fact, it says, but by love serve one another. That's in verse 13. Then it tells us not to bite and devour one another or to consume one of another. Then it tells us in verse 26, let us not be desirous of vainglory, provoking one another, envying one another. That phrase, one another, is, a, is really a key phrase for our Christian li life. If we would just look to that word and 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 follow the examples and the counsel that comes from that word, one another, we would find that we are to love one another, that we're to pray for one another, that we're to edify one another, that we're to prefer one another, that we're to serve one another. And then it tells us, those are the positive things that we do, but then it tells us not to provoke one another, not to to envy one another, not to uh, consume one another, bite and devour one another. There's a lot of things there that we're to do. Later on in our verse, we're going to see that we're to bear one another's burdens in verse 2. And so it's, it's all through the scriptures that phrase one another. And so it's a, and, and really, as we have been going through the book of Galatians, we've been talking about the legalist, the Judaizers that Paul had to deal with in his days. And we said that we, we saw what the legalist does. He, he wants to put you under a, all these rules, rituals, <coughs> regulations. And, uh, and Paul was revealing the Galatians, what these people were all about. But I think that there's, well, I think the best way to find out what a legalist is, is put him next to somebody that needs to be restored. Somebody that's been overtaken by a fault. You put a group of Christians next to somebody that's been caught 
in a transgression. And you'll find out who the spiritual ones are and who are the legalists because the legalists will bite and devour and consume that person and the spiritual one will love that person back to a strong Christian walk, which Christ wants us to do just and, and, and to do. There is no better way to reveal a legalist than to see how he reacts when a Christian brother or sister is overtaken in a sin. It says, brethren, if a man, notice it says in verse 1, chapter 6, if a man be overtaken, the word there is caught in the Greek, or and uh, I think um, he's caught in the act of the sin or he's overtaken. That is that he's been swallowed up by, well, he's been flirting with it for a while. Now he's, now he's in bondage once again to it. And he says if this person has been caught up in a fault or a sin or a transgression is really the word transgression you who are spiritual restore such a one in the spirit of meekness considering thyself lest you also be tempted <coughs> in other words <clears throat> a legalist when he comes in contact with a brother overtaken in a fault he will usually exploit the brother where the spiritual ones will seek to restore. The word restore here means to mend. It's a picture of a person that uh, has a dislocated ankle or a broken bone. Uh, something's happened to him. He's been injured. And now, we're not talking about the non-believer. We're not talking about the, the, the heathen, okay? But we're talking about us, believers in Jesus Christ, that have been caught in sin, in some type of transgression, some type of, of uh, fault in our, in our walk with Christ. We've uh, maybe possibly grown cold in our devotion to God, which is the key in any man's life, <clears throat> to keep away from sin is to have an ongoing devotion with God. If he's out of the word, if he's out of prayer, if he's out of fellowship, if he's out of, of just being with his brothers and sisters in Christ, eventually that man will fall to sin. There's no strength there. There's no nourishment. And when a man falls into that, the legalist will love to, well, he'll love to, 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 to exploit it. Um, whereas the, the spiritual man seeks to restore. And so the man who has been caught in sin, he's been dislocated. He's, he's been injured. He's, he's down on the field. Um, and he needs to be helped. But the legalist will condemn a fallen one in order to make himself look good. They love that. They love to point their fingers, <coughs> judge the brother rather than restore him. A legalist will use the fallen brother to, well, widely publicize it and boast how right and good he is. A legalist will compare and compete to make himself look good and the others look bad. The legalist will never will consider himself, as it tells us here in verse 1, because he, well, he just wants to make sure that you know that he could never commit a sin like that. A believer knows... He stands only by the grace of God. Do you know that? You know, I mean, um, if it wasn't for the grace of God, there go I, right? 
And, um, and Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 11, if you're comparing yourself to others, you're not wise. We should never compare ourselves to one another. If we're going to make comparisons, let's compare ourselves to who? Jesus Christ, right? But if I start comparing myself to one another, to us, I can always find somebody that's not doing as good as I am. And you can do the same thing. You can always say, well, look at that. I, I will never. And, and, and there you go. You're just like that Pharisee that standing there going, you know, I thank God I'm not like him. And a legalist will point his fingers and help nobody but buy, bite and devour and consume and just break up the chance of God being glorified. A believer knows he stands only by the grace of God. Each of us is prone to the same sins that we see in other people. Matter of fact, Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, you remember he says, if you, uh, he says, judge not lest you be judged. Now, a lot of people that are usually in sin will throw that verse in your face. Hey man, don't judge me. But we are called to make judgments. But it's a very delicate procedure. Jesus likened it to eye surgery. Now, how many of you would like me to do eye surgery on you this morning? You know that, that, no, no way. But the great physician, our Lord Jesus Christ, he said that, it, that, that the matter of judging and, and dealing with a brother that's, that needs to be judged is a delicate thing. It's like eye surgery. He says, it's, he says then first of all, remove the moat or the, the beam out of your eye before you take the splinter out of your brother's eye. So he tells us that, first of all, we should take a look at ourselves, consider ourselves here. <coughs> Make sure that we're not in sin ourselves. I love how Roy Hessen, in his book, We Would See Jesus and also uh, The Calvary Road. If you've never read those books, you need to. He says there in his books that Excuse me. He says in his books that usually when we're looking at that speck in our brother's eye, it's the reflection of the beam in our own eye. And I go, whoa. You know, if you, if you really think about it, that's probably what you're, you're seeing. Make sure that you judge yourself first before you judge another person. Now, it tells us that we're not to cast our pearls before swines or dogs because be our pearls will be trampled underneath them and stuff like that. That's a judgment call, isn't it? You've got to determine who's a swine or who's a dog. You've got to figure out, hey, wait a minute, that's, this guy's not right on or not right. That's a judgment call. So it is telling us to make a judgment, but it's telling us to be careful how we make that judgment. <clears throat> and so Galatians tells us that when we do that, we are to do it in a way where we are restoring our brother rather than judging him, condemning him, taking him down. Often, when a brother falls, we have the human tendency to say, serves him right. What do you expect? You remember the story of Abraham and, uh, and Lot? Remember Abraham, was God was blessing. Lot was being blessed because of Abraham, and, and he had all these sheep and everything, and, and pretty soon, Abraham and Lot's uh, herdsmen were at it. They were conflicting. They were fighting each other. And, and Abraham says, look, Lot, 
you're my nephew and, and we're family and, and, and uh, you know, we shouldn't be fighting like this. So why don't you choose where you want to go and I'll go the opposite way. If you go north, I'll go south. If you go east, I'll go west. I, whatever you decide to do, what, you pick it out. And he preferred somebody else other than himself. And so when he did that, he, he gave a, a, a Lot his choice. And you remember what Lot did. He set his tent towards Sodom. And next thing you know, we see that he's there by Sodom. And next thing you know, he's in Sodom. Well, you remember there was the five kings, the battle of the five kings that came down <coughs> and overtook all the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. There were about five or six cities down there, and, and they took their kings, took their, uh, um, their people uh, captive. They took all the wealth of the city and carried them away into captivity. One of those people that was carried away into captivity was Lot, Abraham's nephew, a man that had enjoyed the, the friend of God, Abraham, and the house of God, Bethel. And now he's in, in dire straits. I mean, he's held captive. And when the news came to Abraham, hey, these kings came down, took all the people of Lot, I mean, all the people of Sodom and Gomorrah, and Lot was taken with him. What did Abraham do? He goes, serves him right. You know, guy was so into himself and took his, chose the wrong things and was living for his own flesh and, and everything else like that. Serves him right. He should be in bondage. Let him suffer. No, you know the story. He didn't do that. What he did was he went after, he grabbed 300 of his own trained servants and he grabbed them and said, let's go rescue them. And he went out and re rescued Lot. And he did. When we see a brother overtaken in a fault, we should care enough to go for their help, to rescue them. Well, but we do it in a way that doesn't expose them, but we do it in a way that edifies them, builds them back up, encourages them, and causes them to repent and confess their sins before God and seek for forgiveness. Not to, to embarrass them. Not to tear them down. To the point where he can't, uh, he, he's, he's ruined in a sense. You remember Paul in the book of Corinthians when he got word that there was a man that was sleeping with his mother-in-law. And uh, this was unheard of, Paul says. Even the heathens don't do this, this thing. Oh, they'll sleep with children, they'll be pedophiles, but they wouldn't do something like that, too. And so they, 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 they'll, this is just unheard of, but you guys are boasting about it. And he says, I've already judged this matter. He says, send them out. Send them out. And turn him over to, to Satan that he might learn not to, dis, you know, for the destruction of his flesh, that he might not learn how to blaspheme like this. And they did. They sent him out. Then when Paul wrote the second Corinthians, he was writing them and he goes, now guys, he said, this brother has, has and he calls him a brother, he said, this brother has repented. Now bring him back in. Because we know how Satan works. How Satan loves to get advantage over people. And how to, he loves to destroy people. He said, we're not ignorant of his devices. And he says, so bring him back in that Satan doesn't get advantage over him or over us. So if a brother falls, we should seek to restore such a one. How Proverbs talks about how love covers a multitude of sins. But the legalist, the Judaizer, <coughs> the guy that wants to promote himself, make himself look good in front of everybody else, will use this to, ex to exploit the matter for himself, for his own gain. And so Paul is matching up the legalist, and he's putting him up against a, 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 a 
test case in a sense. How does he react towards brothers that fall? Those that are spiritual will respond in a way that, that they restore, that they put back in joint the broken leg. Now, I've never had a broken leg. Anybody here has ever had a broken leg or a broken arm? Anybody? You know? And it's several of you here. Now, I'm told that when it gets set, it's not a good feeling. It's kind of painful. And, um, but you are glad for a doctor that knows what he's doing, number one, and he's careful about setting it right and putting it back in its joint. And, uh, I mean, I've had, you know, I told you guys the other day, I, I was walking towards my chair up upstairs, and as I was walked there, I just smacked my toe really good uh, on this thing. And, and when I looked down, my toe was pointing this way, with my foot pointing that way. It was like, it was like you know, it was like, you know, it just wasn't supposed to look like that, <laughs> you know? And, and so I go, whoa. And so I grabbed a hold of it, and I pulled it out, and I put it back in. I could feel, you know, the crunch. And it, it hurt, but I was glad. I didn't want to walk like that, you know. I didn't want a foot that looked like that, you know. And because it would have been grown back like that. I mean, it would have gotten infected or probably, you know, knowing me. But, but, it, but that's... That's what happens. But you put it back in. Now, when you do something like that, it takes time and it takes care and it takes concern for that brother that's dislocated or broken. And you've got to be willing to do what you need to do to set him straight again. To be able to put that joint back in to its proper place. Remember, he's a member of the body of Christ. A member of your body as well. And so you put that person back into its rightful place so that you can, you know, what, what. And, and so we want to fix that. So when we are, now sin, when it, when it gets into our lives, it affects us personally, it affects God, and it affects other people as well. When it, if, if, first of all, it affects us, that is, it stops my fruit bearing. Just as we read here, the, all this fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, all these characteristics begin to stop, begin to dry up, begin to take, wither up. I, I have no peace. I have no joy. I have, I have no patience for pu other people or, or even myself. I, I have no gentleness or goodness or faith or, or anything else like that when I'm dislocated. Uh, meekness. This, this, this gentleness that, no way, I, I don't have that. Or self-control. <coughs> and so, so it starts to affect. And then it weakens my desire for the Lord's return as well. Sin, when I'm sinning, I don't want the Lord to come back. I go, oh, please don't come back today. And I don't want to look for his return. And thirdly, it, 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 it destroys my usefulness. I just don't want to be used anymore. I don't feel like I can be used anymore. Then it affects God as well. How does sin affect God? My sin. Well, it grieves him. It grieves him. It grieves the Holy Spirit. And secondly, when I sin, I am joining Christ to Belial. When I sin openly, when I sin I bring Christ into the action of, of, of my sin. And then it, it affects others. It affects the church. 
Sin affects the church. It affects our families. And it affects our friends as well. It, it has a tendency to, to permeate all through. You remember what Paul said, the little leaven leavens the whole lump. If you allow something to continue on and fester and all that, eventually it will affect everything. So deal with sin in a, in a, in a strict way, but also in a loving way. You're not to, 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 to um, wash it away and just say, oh, well, that's them. You know, that's just who they are. No, you, you come to them. Remember, Jesus said there's a, there's a, a, a way to do it. He said, if, you, if your right hand offends you, <coughs> cut it off. If your right eye offends you, pluck it out. Now, does he mean pluck out your eye? Does he mean cut off your hand? You do something wrong? <clears throat> you know, well, that's the last hand you're going to cut off because you're not going to use this one to cut the, that one off. Because you can sin just as good with this hand as you can with that hand. <clears throat> and you can sin with your left eye as well as the right eye. And then you can sin and, uh, with, so he's not telling us to start dismembering yourself, but he's saying as drastic as, 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 as cutting a piece of your flesh off, deal drastically with your own sin. Cut it off. Don't taper off. Remember a guy was, I, I think I've told you this story, but he was into this one particular sin, and, 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 and he, I, I told him, you've got to cut it off. You've got to stop it. And um, he came back a couple of weeks later, hey, I'm, I've, 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 I've stopped. I asked his wife, I says, has he? And she says, no, stopping to him means that he's just tapered off. And that's what he, what he did. He had just tapered it off. No, Jesus said, don't taper it off. Cut it off. That's the only way we deal with sin. Now, if a person fails to do that, you who are, are spiritual, mature in, the, in Christ, go to that brother. Go to that sister. Talk to him. Privately. Go to him. Matthew chapter 18 so that you might gain that brother, that you might gain him, restore him, that you might win him over. And then, if he doesn't, then you are to bring two or three more with you, another person or two other persons. You're still keeping it minimal, and you're not exposing them. But you come to him and you... Seek to have him admit that he sins sin and that he will confess his sins, that he gets broken by it. And if he doesn't, after the first or the second admonishment, after you bring a couple of brothers with you <coughs> that know him, know of the situation, don't go out and make witnesses. You go out and you find those that know the same situation that you know about. And when you have that done, if he doesn't listen, then you take it to the church leadership. You take it to those that have the authority in the church to deal with the brother or the sister. And then if after their admonishment, then you're to treat that person as a heathen. Now what does that mean? You turn them over. You ask them to leave, and when they don't leave, or when they do leave, you pray for them. Because now you're treating them as a heathen, somebody that's lost. And what are we supposed to do with heathens? Win them to Christ. Never giving up on them. And so he says now, he says, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness or gentleness. It's th this is the attitude that you should have, not condemnation, not not in, in uh, thinking that you're upper or better or greater than they are, but you are to come with meekness, power under control, a gentleness about you. One of the characteristics of the Spirit of God. 
being spirit-led all this time. But also make sure that you consider yourself. Consider yourself because you know what? Every single one of us can do the same thing. But the legalist, oh, he'll confess, I would never do something like that. I thank God I'm not like them. And so he says, bear ye one another's burdens. So you come and you pick him back up, but now you hold him up. How? By bearing his burdens. You pick him up, but now you want to hold him up by bearing his burden. Now, now notice it says this. He says, bear ye one another's burdens, so fulfill the law of Christ. Now, what this burden, this word burden means is a heavy, heavy load. A load that no man could carry. Um, <coughs> excuse me. In verse 5 it says, for every man shall bear his own burdens. That sounds like a contradiction, huh? We're supposed to bear one another's burdens, but every man is supposed to carry his own burden. In verse 5, it sounds like a contradiction, but it's not, because it's two different types of burdens. There are things in life that comes to us that we are just overwhelmed by, right? You ever had those things? That you know you can't carry it yourself. You need help. You need somebody to be with you. And, and God tells us, brothers and sisters in Christ, to bear one another's burdens. When there are things that, that happen to us in life, in, in, in our life, we're, we should be able to come alongside a brother or a sister and say, let me help you with that. But what he's saying here, let every man bear his own burdens, means there are other burdens. And this word burden means uh, like a backpack. Some of you walked in them with one. Or you have, have them. And, and that's, that's, a, that's verse 5, a backpack. Just your daily responsibilities. Those responsibilities you're to take care of. You're supposed to take care of. You're supposed to handle on your own. You have, you're like your family, your children. Now you might ask me to go and, and, and hey, kid, my car broke down. Can you pick my kids up from school? And so you'll go over there and pick up your kids. But, but you don't have the... The first burden here to the big responsibility of, or I mean the second burden here, of the responsibility of taking care of your kids. You just realize he's got a burden that's, that he can't meet right now, can't carry, so I'll, I'll, I'll go get your kids or something like that. So this is the type of burden that he's talking about, these two different types of burdens. <coughs> Excuse me. He says, he said, bear ye one another's burdens and fulfill the law of Christ. For if a man thinks himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. You know, it's funny how sin is. It gets you thinking that you're something else. That you're really something. You're all that in a bag of chips, you know. And, 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 and you, you think, you, man, you know, I, I've got it together. I, man, I've, I've pulled it together. And, and, and really, you're nothing. We're nothing. And it's just the grace of God. And, and he says, when that guy starts thinking this, the Bible tells us, take heed. When that man thinks he stands, take heed, lest he what? Fall. Pride and the haughty spirit comes before destruction, doesn't it? And a fall. When a man starts thinking that he's more than what he is, he's setting himself up for trouble. So walk in humility, walk in meekness, he says, let every man prove his own work, and, let, and then shall he have rejoicing in himself alone, and not in, in another. For every man should bear his own work. That is, that you are to do your own work. That is, that there are things that you should be taken care of in your life that nobody else should have to take care of. They're your responsibility, your work. But then there's things that come up in our lives that we just need help. <coughs> we, need, we need that person to come along and, and say, you know what, you're sick. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to help you. What do you need? Who do you need to go see? Who, who, who do you need to, 
uh, you know, meat or, or who needs to, you know, your family needs to food and so we supply food or, or whatever. There's, there's those burdens that come alongside that we, we pick up. And so for every man shall bear his own burden. So verse 6 it says, let him let him that is taught in the word share with him that teaches in all good things. <clears throat> when a brother finally admits that he's, he's sinned, he's confessed his sins um, to God, he's sought forgiveness, we are then to encourage him, bear his burdens. We're to forgive him, lest Satan gets an advantage over us. We are to regard him as our brother, not our enemy, as 2 Thessalonians 3.15 tells us. And then we are to look at ourselves. And then we are to hold him up by carrying his burdens uh, uh, through the day, but, but also encouraging him to carry his own burden. We're to build him up next in verse 6. Verse 6, we, we're to pick him up, we're to hold him up, but now we're to pick him up or build them up, excuse me, and that is, <coughs> let him that is taught in the word share with him that teaches in all good things. Let him that is taught in the word share with him, or it, it says here, uh, communicate in some translations, or others, it's um, it, the, actually the Greek word here is koinia. It is it let him that is taught in the word share or fellowship with him or communicate. That's another word to fellowship. We are to fellowship with him that teaches in all good things. Let him that is taught, that is, let the person that's being taught, the one that's being restored, let him be taught, share or fellowship with him that teaches in all good things. That is that I am to, to, to build him up, and he's to be built up. I, I just don't say, okay, you, you got it, confess it, you got rid of it. Okay, so long. No, spend time with him, fellowship with him, koinonia with him. Have that communication ongoing with him. You see, what, what, what the point that Paul is making is, is that restoration of a fallen brother is not an overnight quote, success. It's going to take a while. Why? Because when a brother falls, it's not because he's, he, he's, he's fallen like that. It's been a process. When you and I sin, and I know what I'm talking about because I know how sin works in my own life, is that it's a process. It, 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 it gets in there and it, it takes time and then we finally yield into it we finally say okay it wasn't just a boom you know just you know i'm gonna go out and sin right you know there no you you ponder it you think about it you go what if i do what will i do if i do it how will i cover it up how, how can i get away with it uh what if somebody finds out about it what am I going to do? And, and you begin to pr the whole process of, of, of trying to, 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 to work it all out so, so you can have your fun, but, but you don't want to get hurt by it. And so it's in all this process. And so you come, and him that is being taught, let him fellowship with him that is, being that is teaching in all good things. We need to take our time with that brother, that sister. It's just not a one-shot deal. Now, <coughs> you're not supposed to take his responsibilities from him, his daily responsibilities, but you're to take the heavy burdens, those things that weigh him down, that destroyed him. You're to carry him with him. Because after you've are restored. There's a time of guilt. There's a time of condemnation. There's a time of, of just why, why, why. 
And, and if, you've ever, if you've ever blown it, you know Jesus forgive you, has forgiven you, but you know you're, you're, you're still condemning yourself. And uh, you just, you're just glad your feet aren't behind your backside. They're down below because you'd be kicking yourself all the time. And, uh, and so <clears throat> this is what he, what he says. Now, we're going to stop here. And um, let's pray. And next week we want to bring in this of don't be deceived because this ties in with this whole restoration too. Whatsoever you sow, that shall you reap. Amen? Lord, we thank you so much for your word. We ask God that you would bless and minister. We thank you for your kindness in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's all stand.